Open your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 4, and we are going to read verse 1 to 7. As a prisoner for the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body, one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned. May God bless the reading from His Holy Word. Please take your seats. So good morning once again. We have come to the finale of our series about the church because next week we will start already with the kickoff of our 40 days campaign. So for the past four weeks, we've been going through the lessons about the church, rooted in the church. And so far, we have learned that, you know, the church, according to the Bible, is described as the body of Christ. So we must all act as members of the body of Christ. That the church is the family of God. That's why we treat each other as family members. We are no longer strangers and aliens but we are fellow citizens, we are members of the household of God. So the church is the household of God. Amen? God Himself is our Father. And then we also learned that the church is the temple of the Spirit. And again, when we talk about the church, we are not talking about the building, but we are talking about us people. So this edifice is just the location, the venue upon which the household the temple of God lives. So we are the temple of the Spirit, and the Bible says that the Spirit dwells with us. And as a temple, our main, our main reason for existence is to worship the Lord. And that's why we are here today. Amen? Are you here today to worship the Lord? So because we are the temple of the Spirit. And then we also learn the purpose of the church, that the church exists to bring to bring unbelievers so that they become believers. And then we have the ministry of belongingness so that these believers will become members of the church, and that is who you are today. And if you are not yet a member of this church, that's why we have a belong class. But we don't end with you being just a member. That The church is also there to make disciples so that these members will become disciples and we build these disciples so that in turn we become disciple makers so that we can go and bless others so that's why the church exists so we are in the manufacturing of disciples our main product are disciple makers who will serve the lord and so to end this short series what should we do with the church? Now that we are part of the church, we benefit from the church, we grow in our Christ-likeness in the church, we develop our spiritual muscles in the church, so therefore, what must we do? There's only one answer to that, and that is to love the church. Amen? To love the church. So that's our lesson today, loving the church. How are we supposed to love the church? And here, we go back to the book of Ephesians where we started in this series, if you remember. The book of Ephesians is actually, this letter is a circular letter. This is not just addressed to the congregation in Ephesus, but this is addressed to other churches in that region. So it's a circular letter. That means that this letter is supposed to be read by the other Christian churches in that region, all right, of Asia Minor. And, and the purpose 
is for people to understand what is the church. So the main theme of the Apostle Paul in writing this letter is for people to understand the church. What is the church? Why do we exist as a church? Now, in chapter 4, Paul starts to give us ways in order for us to appreciate and to love the church. Okay? So, our desire today in this lesson is for us to know how it is that you and I are supposed to love the body of Christ. That we are not just coming here to benefit, but we are here also to serve. All right? To serve others. How are we supposed to love the church? How can we effectively love the church that Jesus Christ loved so much that He gave up Himself for the church? Now, there are three that we can find in our text this morning. All right? Number one, this is the first thing that how we can love the church. Preserve the unity of the church. So the first way to effectively demonstrate our love for our church is to preserve her unity. If there's one thing important to the body of Christ, as repeated in, in the letters of Paul, especially to Corinthians, to Ephesus, and in, in Thessalonica, is always that Paul wants the church to be united. Okay? Because it's one way to show the world outside that we are truly the body of Christ, that we are united together. Notice again the verse, reading from verse 1, As a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. We are to live our lives worthy of the calling. What calling? The calling to be part of His body. The calling to be saved. The calling to be heaven-bound. We are heaven-bound people. Amen? We are no longer going to hell because of what Jesus did on the cross. And that is why the cross is at the center of our church. It's, it's quite obvious to remind everyone that you and I are no longer going to hell, but we're going to heaven because of what Jesus did on that cross. And we are to live our lives worthy of that calling. And so be completely humble and gentle and be patient, bearing with one another in love. And by the way, Paul mentioned the word love, agape love, three times in this 16 verses that we are going to study. And so we say that this is how we are going to love the church, by preserving its unity. Now first, let us see the call for unity. We find that in verse 3, where we find Paul calling us, exhorting the church to be united. Notice verse 3, and this is the focus on verse 1 to 10. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Notice the emphasis there. Keep the unity of the Spirit. Keep the unity of the Spirit. We are to make every effort. Now, the words there, keep the unity, the word there, keep, the Greek word there is tereo. Tereo. And it literally means to guard, to maintain. All right? To keep it intact. And this is in the present tense. Therefore, it means that God wants us to continue preserving, guarding, protecting the unity of the church. We are not just to expect unity. We are not to produce unity because that unity is produced by God. We are to protect it and preserve it. Remember, when you and I got saved, it was the Holy Spirit who baptized us into the church. It was the Holy Spirit that brought us together. All right? Our goal, therefore, our duty, therefore, is to make sure that this unity is being preserved. That's how we truly love the church. If you truly love BUCCI, 
as the church where God has put you, you must preserve its unity. In other words, never contribute to anything that would destroy that bond of unity because I tell you, you truly sin. You hurt the body of Christ when we contribute to the disunity. All right? And notice the emphasis of Paul there. Make every effort. There's only one Greek word there. It's spodazo. It means to show full diligence to do your best. That's the essence of the word. We are not just to preserve unity, but I have to put so much effort. Now, why is this important, brethren? Because I tell you, unity is not automatic. All right? You leave people in a room, and you allow these people to just be who they are according to their attitude. And soon you will realize that there's going to be factions and divisions and fighting. I don't know with you, but uh, you know, in our family, especially you know, for us, some of us, we belong to a big family. And you know, when there are family gatherings, there, we had fun, we enjoy. But I always notice this. Allow that family reunion to last for three days. Three days of being together, I tell you. <laughs> the real colors will surface <laughs> and they will soon fight. You know, mga igsoon, magsugod na nag That's why it's meant that these siblings, they are far away from each other. And you know, occasionally during holidays, they come and they enjoy. But again, leave them for a week and soon there will be fights. <laughs> now, it's different in the body of Christ. Even if we stay here every day, you know Why? Because we are commanded to make every effort. All right? We are to do something about it. We don't just allow it to happen. We make it happen. Now, in the New American Standard Version, said to be the most literal translation of the Bible, it says there, being diligent to preserve the unity. We are to be diligent. We are to do everything necessary if we love Jesus Christ and if we love His church because this is His body, we are to be diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Now, Paul also tells us the cause. There's a reason why we need to preserve this unity and it's in verse 4 to 6. In verse 4 to 6, if you notice in your Bible, Paul gives us seven reasons why this unity of the Spirit must be preserved. There are seven things that unite us. This is the basis, this is the foundation of our unity. And what are these? Notice Paul mentions seven ones. Seven times he mentions one. Notice this. First reason, because there is one body. That's why we have to preserve unity because the body of Christ is not divided. See? It's not divided. There's one body. What else? One spirit. See? If, if there is one spirit in dwelling believer, that spirit is not the spirit of division. It's not the spirit of factions. No. It's a spirit of peace and unity. So, one body, one spirit. What else? We were called to one hope. There's only one direction, one hope. So why should we be divided? That's the point. What else? We were called to one Lord. There's only one Lord Jesus Christ. There are not three, but only one Lord. We only have one faith. And this faith is not referring to the faith, the trust that we have in Christ. This faith, if you study the context, this faith is something to do with the body of doctrines passed on to us by the apostles, the Bible. That's why we, we have a statement of faith, remember? And every church has a statement of faith. Why? Because that statement of faith summarizes what we believe as a body of Christ. All right? We can be having different opinions on, on other minor issues, but we have this one 
body of doctrine that we hold on to according to the Scripture. What else? We have one baptism. You know, when you come to church, you don't have three kinds of baptism. There's only one baptism. And of course, Paul here is talking about water baptism. That's why you only have to be baptized at least once. <laughs> See? You don't need more baptism to be more saved. You need to have only one baptism. What is that? One God and Father of all who is over all, through all, and in all. See that? These seven foundations, and that is the cause. Paul is saying, hey, my dear brethren in the church, preserve this unity. All right? Don't allow yourself to be used by the devil. Listen, friends, listen. If there's one thing that the devil wants to happen in the church, he wants the church to be disunited. It's so sad that even here in Cebu, there are churches, you know, who grew very fast, but then also quickly faded. Satan wants to destroy the church. And so, never allow yourself to be used by the devil. All right? That's why it's important that we preserve it. So when you say preserve it, that means I have to be an active doer. I must do something. I cannot just let the spirit of the vision cause this unity in the body of Christ. All right? Now, what are some practical steps? You know what? Paul gives us some practical steps in verse 1 and 2 on how we can preserve unity. All right? Look at verse 2. This is how we can preserve unity. The first one is this, be completely humble. Okay? How can we be united? Paul says, be humble. You know, the Greek word here, listen, the Greek word here is a complicated word. In fact, according to scholars, this word is not found in the classical Greek during Paul's time. They were saying that the word that Paul used here is something that Christians or perhaps he himself coined. The Greek word is typhinophrosone. It's even so hard. And it simply means lowliness. You know what? This word does not even exist in the Greek vocabulary at the time. They don't have such word. In other words, this humility is something unique to Christianity. You know, because at the time, you want to be somebody. You don't want to be a nobody. But Paul says, in order for us to preserve the unity of the church, we have to be lowly. In other words, do not think of yourself more highly than you should. See? Because the moment, the moment, if the self, it's the self, you know, in the gathering, and if your mind and heart is all about yourself, then it's so easy for you to react when people start to talk. You react, and it's so easy for what? Factions and divisions and divisive talk to take place. And so, if we want, if I want to preserve the unity of the body of Christ, I have to tone down myself. I have to remind myself, this is not about me. See? Humility. All right? Now, next, what else? Gentle. Be completely gentle. Now, this word can literally also mean meekness. All right? It refers to that mild-spirited and self-control. In other words, it's something that you can control your emotions. Now, this is very true because if people are not gentle, it's so easy for people, other people to get hurt, other people to, to be, you know, frustrated. But the Bible says we have to be gentle, meaning to say we need to approach conflicts and differences with a calm, and a peaceful demeanor that comes from the Holy Spirit. See? Gentleness. Are you gentle? See? 
That's very important. We have to be gentle in how we treat each other. Dili kay, good morning, good morning. See? Or bag, oh no. See? Now, of course, there are people who are having bad days. Are you having bad day today? Now, we have to consider that sometimes some people are having bad days. Of course, some Christians are always like they always have bad day every day. Now, how do we suppose to react over it? Should we give them the same bad day attitude? No. That's where you preserve unity. For example, in our gathering, you know, someone is having a bad day, having a bad mood. If I'm going to preserve the unity of the church, I will not have to deal with the kind of attitude that that person is. In other words, I choose to be gentle. See? If the spirit of that person is already influenced by the devil, I should protect myself. I should not be affected by you. I will still smile. Hello, sister. It's like bad mood. See? Because it's so easy. Listen, we have to be proactive. That's why the Bible says make every effort. You know why? Because it's so easy for our attitude to simply switch. And I always mention this, the parking lot is always a testing ground of our faith. <laughs> Sometimes the CR. See? It's so easy for us to lose our control. But the Bible says, be completely humble. This is not about me. So if, if someone is, is angry or having a bad mood, okay, if you react to that, that means you're affected. But then I choose not to react. I want to humble myself. This is not about me. This is about God. This is God's church. And so I have to maintain God's attitude. Amen? Be gentle. And then, Next, be patient. Now, this is something important. The Greek word is makrothumia. When you hear the word makro, it means something big or long or large. And then thumia, okay, where we get the word thomos or thermos, the temp. <laughs> In other words, the meaning of this word, of this compound word, is having a long or what? You have a big capacity to take temperature. <laughs> That's why it's defined as patience, macrothomia. In other words, you have this capacity to endure. Even if there are already reasons for you to get, to get angry, to be mad, you are still, you know, ang boiling point sa water is 100 degrees Celsius, right? But if you're filled with the Holy Spirit, it's make it 200, 300. Hmm. So in other words, if the water is only boiling, you are still not boiling. Why? Because you have macrothomia. And why do you have to do this? Why should I be patient with others, Pastor? Because God commands you to preserve unity. See? In other words, if I allow my bomb inside to explode, it will not glorify my Lord. See? So I don't have to put up with you, with your attitude. I simply control my temperature. I still smile, okay? And if, 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 again, if there is nothing good that come out from your mouth because your heart is already burning, keep quiet. See? Remember, the Bible says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And the Bible says, the heart is the most deceitful. Jesus says, it's not from the outside that makes you evil, it's from the inside. And He says, it's the heart that makes you say nasty words. It, it's from the heart that gossips. It's the heart that slanders. These things that affects unity. And so if that heart of yours is enthroned by Christ, then don't allow the attitudes of the devil to come out. All right? So always be patient. Okay? Endurance. Endure. Be willing to endure. All right? And what else? Bearing with one another. Forbearance. The Greek word is anexomai. Right? Anexomai. It means to carry. Alright? So bearing with one another. What does it mean to bear with one another? It, it means you carry the burden of others. It means you understand. 
bearing something, carrying a person in love, even though they're hostile, even though they're difficult to handle, even though they are your enemies, the Bible says you bear with that person. See? That's how we preserve unity. Be humble, be gentle, be patient. And bear with one another. So how do I do that, Pastor? Say, for example, again, this one brother or sister in Christ is having a day. You have a good day. You know, you woke up praising the Lord and you enter the room and then you kiss the person and the person doesn't like to be kissed. Okay? Don't allow the negative force of that person to affect you. You carry the burden. In other words, you understand Perhaps this person is going through some difficulties in life. I don't want to be an additional burden. See? So you unburden that person. You bear. See, that's the idea of bearing one another. The reason the person is having some bad mood because that person is carrying some burden. So the Christians, in order for us to preserve unity, I have to carry that load. So perhaps you want to pray for that person. See? The last thing that person needs is for you to react negative. So do not act negative to that person. Treat that person well. And so, if you do that, you fulfill the law of love. Amen? Bearing with one another in love. So, brethren, there you have it. That's how we preserve the unity of the body of Christ. All right? We humble ourselves. It's not about you. Please think less of yourself. Always focus others. Be gentle in everything. Let us tame our tongue. All right? Be patient. Have that long, long and wide and huge place to control yourself and then carry each other's burden. All right, let's go to the second. How do we show love for the body of Christ? So one is to preserve the unity. Two is to prepare the maturity of the church. Prepare the maturity of the church. So let me explain the word prepare. It was He, look, let's jump to verse 11. It was He that refers to Christ. Remember, it is Jesus who apportioned gifts and grace to every member of the body of Christ. So, if you are truly born again, you have that grace. No believer, no believer can say that I have, I don't receive that grace. No, all of us, we've been given grace. But here, Jesus is giving gifts to the church as a whole. Notice this. It was He, if you read the previous verse, it refers to Christ. He gave. So Jesus has a gift for the church. And what is Jesus' gift for the church? It was He who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors and teachers. So there are four kinds of men that Christ gave to the church in order for the church to mature. Apostles and prophets. Now, there's so many, there are so many interpretations. Some churches say that there are still apostles and prophets today. Well, some churches say, well, they don't cease anymore. They don't exist anymore. They have already ceased. Now, apostles, they refer to the 12, of course. But then, Later on, there were others who were called apostles, like Barnabas was called an apostle. Silas was called an apostle. Timothy was called an apostle. So in that sense, an apostle, the meaning of apostle simply means one who is being sent. And so the office of apostleship, I would say it ceased. In other words, it ended with the last apostle when John died. Because in that sense, apostle, we say that the capital A apostle, the apostles, it refers to those appointed himself by Jesus himself. Remember, he appointed 12. So when those apostles die and they're in heaven, that apostleship ceases. But in the sense of us being sent to the world to teach, in that sense of the word, I would say apostleship is there. Now, what about prophets? Prophets... There are two ways or two ministry of a prophet. One is forth 
telling and the other one is foretelling. Now, I don't think it's normal nowadays in the church that there are foretell fortune tellers. <laughs> Not in the sense of a prophet, but as a foreteller, as a prophet as used by Paul in 1 Corinthians 14, if you read 1 Corinthians 14, a prophet there is simply someone who exhorts others with the Word of God. Not your own word, but they have the gift of exhorting the word, people with the Word of God. That is a prophet. In our words, one of my job, one of my work, and one of my ministry as your pastor is a prophet. In the sense that every Sunday I stand up here to foretell the Word of God. See? So that's prophet. And then there's the evangelist. You know, an evangelist, the one who goes around to preach the word. And then some to be pastors and teachers. These are not two people, but in the way it's used, pastors and teachers, they are one person. Meaning to say, a pastor or a shepherd is a teacher. Because that's the ministry in the pulpit. That's why when I stand up here, I stand up here Using this gift of God, I pastor you, but also I teach you. Because every sermon is a teaching ministry. Alright? It's not just happening in the Sunday school or Bible study, but the Sunday worship is a teaching ministry. Why? Because the shepherd is also a teacher. Now, these are the works. These are the gifts that Jesus has given to the church. Now, what is the purpose? <laughs> Notice this. To prepare. Alright? I want you to focus on this. Jesus gave the church apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastor teachers. The goal is to prepare God's people. To prepare. Now, that's an in interesting word. Okay? Do you know why, what word is that? Katartismos. Catartismos. This ancient Greek noun was used to describe the restoring of something to its original condition. All right? Or being made complete. This word was used in the Gospels for fishermen mending their nets in order to prepare them for the next use. That's the same word. To prepare. So to prepare, listen, it means that you do something in order to bring it back to its original. And that's the ministry of the pastors and teachers in the church. Preparing God's people. Alright? Equipping. In some other translations, it is translated as to equip. Okay? Now, that's how we love the church. That's how we show our love for the church. We are part of the preparing ministry. We prepare each other. In other words, we try to restore each other for what purpose? Notice this, for works of service. For works of service. What are these works of service? The word service there is where we get the word diakonia. So meaning to say, brethren, not only the deacons are to serve, <laughs> God's people are to serve. Amen? Amen? You don't say, well, I'm not a deacon, so I don't serve in this church. No. It's very clear from this verse that God wants His people to be prepared. Remember? To be equipped, to be restored so that it can be useful for works. And the works there is plural. In other words, there are various works in the church that you and I need to prepare ourselves with. All right? Now, What's the purpose again? Why is it that we prepare ourselves? Why is it that we need to be prepared for works of service? Now, Paul states the very end. So that the body of Christ may be what? May be built up. See? That's how we show our love for the church. God's desire, listen, God's desire for His church is that His church will not remain small and cute. No. He wants His church to grow. He wants His body to be healthy. He wants His body to be built up. And notice the next verse. Until we all reach the unity in the faith, in the knowledge of the Son of God, and become mature. Say mature. 
That's the end. That's the goal. Jesus wants His church to be mature. And in order for us to be mature, we have to be prepared for it. We have to be equipped. See? Jesus doesn't want His church. No matter, you know, God loves children, right? God loves children. We have a song, Jesus loves the little children. But when it's adults playing around like immature children, of course, that doesn't please the Lord. Can you imagine if we are a church, a bunch of church, a bunch of people who are so immature that we easily react, that we easily get hurt, that we become so jealous with each other, we envy each other, and then we become so rude, and we, we, we fight with each other. Now, Jesus doesn't want that kind of a family. Okay? Jesus doesn't want that family. He wants His church to become mature. Because when we are mature, we don't act like kids. <laughs> okay? It's one thing to look young, it's good. Okay? That's why it's okay. Pastor, is it okay? I spend some money to look young. It's okay. It's okay to look young, but to act young, <laughs> to act childish, it's not good. Alright? We have to put away childish things, according to Paul. Let's become mature. And in order for us to become mature, we need help. Amen? That's why there's the people who will prepare us for maturity. And, and our goal is to attain what? Attaining to the whole measure of what? The, the fullness of Christ. What is that, pastor? Attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. What Jesus wants His church is this, that His fullness, His identity, His character, who He is, it's becoming what? It's duplicated, replicated in our lives. That's the goal of Jesus. That's why if you love this church, if you love the Lord, if you love His church, then you want yourself to be prepared for maturity. Amen? And we know that immature children don't want to grow up. They want just to stay young. They want to play around, right? But no, there are stages in our life that we have to say, you know what? I'm done with this attitude. <laughs> okay? I'm done with envying. I'm done with always becoming bitter with, towards others. You know, that doesn't belong to the body of Christ. See? We have to make a decision. Now, let me give you practical steps. How you can prepare for maturity. Okay? And I use acronym steps. Okay? Very simple. First, seek God's guidance. Seek God's guidance. Pray for clarity. Ask the Lord, Lord, can you please show me, if you look at in a mirror, Lord, I want to see in a spiritual mirror, what are the things that I need to remove in my life so that I'll become mature? See? Because if, if all of us here are immature, I tell you, there will be no unity in the church. There will always be fighting and conflicts. So seek God's guidance. Number two, take inventory of yourself. Take a self-inventory. Okay? What are my strengths? How can I help the church to pursue growth? Remember, the goal is for the body of Christ to be built. So make a self-inventory. Take a self-inventory. Second, I mean third, explore ministry opportunities. There are ministry opportunities in our bulletin. <laughs> okay? Don't ever say, I'm going to go play at church. No, no. Let, let me tell you this. If you're part of this church, that means you have a role to play. Now, again, if you are just attending church, if that's what you do week after week, if you just come to shop attendance, and by the way, attendance is never mentioned in the Bible as part of the role. It means you are a body that is missing out your role. And I tell you, one day, let me tell you this. I'm not just saying this as a pastor, but I'm telling you this earlier. One day, maningil yun ang ginoo sa imong life. Alright? Dili na siya ingon nga panghadlok. No. 
Ako'y nahadlok sa ginoo kung di ka mabuhat. Why? Because God will also hold me accountable for you. Okay? That's in Hebrews. Leaders are accountable. So, you are accountable. One day, you will be facing God and God will show you this is how you use your time, talents, sa world. Asa man akong time sa service na kay nakita? Wa kay nakita? Kay wa. Ay, nintungam ako every Sunday. Means, Lord, wa man ay labot. Attendance is not counted. See, if you look in the Bible, appeal ba na sa mga gifting nga the gift of showing up. The gift of attendance every Sunday. No, it's not. See? But every part, so that means the only thing that will count nga wa kay kwan is that di ka tinod Christian, so okay na siya. Kung di ka tinod born again, nga, yeah, show up lang ka, well, it doesn't matter because di makasave. But if you really call, count yourself as saved and you're part of the body of Christ and then you have nothing to do with the body, I tell you, you are really missing out an important journey of your life. And don't wait for the judgment day to come and for you to realize and for you to regret that you miss serving the body of Christ. Simply because I don't know what to do. See? Be part. Explore ministry opportunity. Surely there is something that you can do for the body of Christ in BUCCI. And then, participate in trainings. Remember, the goal is for the body to build up. Mayon tanga, Lord, nga na magyot ang among church, hinay kayo maka-build up. Mayon siya, ang ang daghan man kayo, nagkumbitay din ang mga body, ngaway mga gamit. Can you imagine if there are so many parts of your body, you have eyes but you can see, you have ears but you can't hear, na itiil di mo lakaw, see? Na hands di mo work. So, what will happen to that body? It will not grow but sometimes it's so sad that some churches are look paralyzed. They have these members, they have these parts but they are not functioning. See? You don't want to be an unfunctioning but part of the body. So participate and then serve joyfully. Remember the goal? Attaining to the full measure of Christ. All right, let's go to the third. Again, let's review. How do we show love for the church? Pre-serve the unity of the church. Number two, prepare the maturity of the church. So I have to prepare myself in order for the church to mature. And then third, promote the diversity of the church. Now, if you look around, brethren, I want you to look around for a moment. Let's do a very quick, a very quick uh, test. Or, yeah, look around. Do we look like alike? No. Look the same? No. Even our styles, even our hairs are different. Even our, the way we dress. See? Look around. We belong to a church that is so diverse. See? We, we even make, made fun. You know, our church, we are like the, the United Colors of Benetton. You know, everyone is here. See? Praise God for that. We have Africans here. We have Europeans here. See? We have Asians. We have, we have a member who is a Korean. See? We have Chinese. We have Indians. See? There's diversity in this church. And you know what? God loves diversity. Amen? Can you imagine if God created everyone the same? See? Kawa gi challenge sa life. Inigtan-aw na ko ni mo, pariha mignaong. Pariha mignaong tanan. Kaboring, ani, ani, di ba? Sometimes I imagine ba, you know, what if I were an ant, no? And inigtan-aw na ko sa ant, magpariha rin yung pignaong. Di ba? For me, even ants, they don't look the same. <laughs> See? So, promote diversity. That means, God shows that we all be different, but in our difference, we can work together to love Him. Amen? Diversity of the church. Look, look, at, look at verse 15 and 16. We are about to end. Instead, speaking the truth in love. So there's the word love again. Speaking the truth in love, we will in all things grow up into Him who is the head that is Christ. Now, it's important because in our diversity, the context is that in our diversity, 
Of course, we want to speak the truth, but if we don't put love in the truth, sometimes in our diversity, we hurt each other. Abala ah, nakka masuko ka basa mo ni Oh, di ba? We always hear that those comments. I don't care. I mean, that's how you react. Well, that's the truth. I'm just telling the truth. But notice what the Bible says: speaking the truth in love. Di ba? Nilad kay kagbatasan, but I love you. Oh, di ba? But I love you. Hala. Oh, that's the truth. <laughs> okay? Speaking the truth in love. Now, what's the goal? Why we have to do this in love? Because the Bible says, so that in all things, take note, in all things, not just church things, in all things, God wants us to grow up into Him. See, the goal is Christ-likeness. And if we want to be like Christ, well, God, Jesus Christ spoke the truth. And yes, it's true. A lot of people got hurt, most especially the religious leaders. They were hurt with the words of Christ. Even Peter was rebuked by Christ and the disciples. But the goal is for us to grow up into Him who is the head that is our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, let, let me segue to 1 Corinthians 12, 12, because this is the parallel passage so that we understand more what Paul is talking in Ephesians. English Paul, just as a body, though one, has many parts. Say many. Okay, we are many, but all its parts form one body, so it is with Christ. So, Paul is saying, because we are the church, we are many, many parts, that means we are diverse. We don't have the same taste. Some of us love sweet, some of us love something that is bitter, some of us like sour, you know, we have different ways, different genera in our styles and likes. And that's okay. Because God doesn't want uniformity in His church. He simply wants Unity. Take note, they are two different words. Uniformity, unity. Na yung mga church na gusto uniformity nga, manimbat ang tanan, parihag yung tagsulubon. Diba? Musuway kag sudiha. Diba? Malibog ka asan. Muntok kong asawa. Ay, pariha man yung tanan, gaputi. Pariha man yung tanan, taas o buhok. Pariha man yung tanan. Libog ka kay pariha tanan, diba? Well, I'm happy that I belong to this church. You know, we, we all have different colors here and it's so easy to, to know someone. See? Imagine, kumpariha tatan nagsulob. Okay? Next week, magsulob tatanan. White, good. Kung di ka white, di ka maluwas. <laughs> Imagine if our church is like that. Do you think you will enjoy? Alright? But we are many parts, different, different styles. But you know, the goal is one. We form as one body of Christ. But in fact, God has placed the parts in the body, every one of them, just as He wanted them. Notice the purpose. So that there should be no division in the body. See? But that its parts should have equal. I, I like that part. That's the point of diversity. Even though we are different, we have different backgrounds, different families, different styles. Some of us came from a very loud family, so saba kay ta magistorya. Others put silent kaayo, silent night pirmi. Okay? Well, the Bible says, let's rejoice. We need to have equal concern for one another. Amen? If you love the church, promote the diversity. Don't make people act like you. Diba? Sometimes atong big group at gusto ta ang tanan maparihan na to kay hilumon man ko so hilumon pug ka. Mm. Dili. See? We need to have equal concerns. See? Dili lang kay we only like the people who are like us. Diba? Kana bang love your own? Kana bang you know I love this group good. Ngano man because we always appreciate each other. Diba? Oy, ngayan kay sam gisulob. Ikaw po, diba? So we just bounce back liking each other. Well, there are times that we don't like. <laughs> and to be honest, it's okay. See? You don't, you don't, your goal in life is not to be liked by everyone. See? The only one thing that we want someone to like is the one above. <laughs> Amen? Make sure that God likes me. That's all. See? And, and I have to have that concern for one another. Now, let's end 
Ephesians 4, 16, for from Him, the whole body joined, held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love. There's the third love as each part does its work. That's the diversity there. You know, the importance of diversity, we promote diversity. We allow, God allows your own skills and talents to show up. I want you to look around in our church. See, you have, you see different parts, different parts. Look at, see, these are all works of different members of our church. The diversity, see? But put them together and it forms a very nice church. This should be a reflection of who we are. Amen? That God has endowed us with different skills. Some of us are good with drawing. Some of us are good with woods. Some of us are good with papers. You know, we are not alike. But then, in our diversity, as each one of us do our part, we grow the church. And the body of Christ blooms. And that's how we will show our love. Promote diversity. See? Make sure that when you share your part in the church, you don't have to do it their way. Do it your way. <laughs> because God has given you that ability. Amen? Not uniformity, but unity. See? And you see there that the, the, the growth of our Lord Jesus Christ will really shine. Now, practical steps. Okay? I just use the word, the acronym LOVE. How do we promote diversity in the church, Pastor? Well, love. You love one another. How do we do that? Look unto others. Okay? Stop looking at yourself all the time. <laughs> See? The problem is focus it is at yourself. No. When you go to church, okay, the Bible says, in your house, look at in the mirror, look, your, look, look at yourself, and then, but once you're in the church, look unto others. See? See the beauty of others. Appreciate the beauty of others. See? Appreciate that they are not like you. Hi, <laughs> praise God. Di ka parehan ako. Alright? And then offer help. Offer help. That's how you promote diversity. You know, because we are diverse, so somehow you have this understanding that there are things that only I can do. Because this gift is given to me. It's not yours. So, I want to help you with what God has given me. See? Offer to help. And then, third, V, value each other's differences. Praise God that you are different than me. Praise God that your skills are not like my skills. Okay? Nice kayo atong choir. Praise God. But can you imagine if all of us are members of the choir? Kinsa na may manglingkod diha? na mo pakpak. Listen po kay ang choir mo pakpak sa ilang self. Up. We are nice choir. <laughs> See? Value each other's differences and then E, encourage each other. Encourage. If you see someone, you know that that person has some abilities but then naulaw siya, you know, please help assist them. Amen? Usher them to the church. Help them. Sometimes, maulaw lang ta. Okay? Sometimes we feel ay di lang ko pastor no maybe you can assist you know someone here has some good abilities in editing or with multimedia you encourage that person that you know what your gift is needed in the body of Christ and if you truly love the Lord promote diversity now in conclusion what does Ephesians 5:25 say Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. If Christ loved the church, then we should do the same. Amen? Love the church, brethren. You know, what, what is something that you can give up for the church? Okay? Maybe there are some times that you need to give up so that you can be part of the church. What have you given up for the church? Jesus gave up His life for you. What, will you, what are you willing to give up for Him? for His church. This is His church. And let me close with this prayer that Paul said. I love this prayer. And I want us to read this together prayerfully. 
Alright, let's say this together. May the Lord make your love increase and overflow for each other and for everyone else, just as ours does for you. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the church. We are your church. Thank you for Jesus Christ who gave up his life so that there's life in the church. And Lord, we just want to appreciate that we are part of BUCCI. Perhaps some of us, we have overlooked that sense of really thanking you personally. Thank you for bringing us to this church. This is not a perfect church. We always say we are work in progress. But we truly want to be a loving church. A church that loves each other's imperfection, each other's diversity, patient with all our rough edges of life. But Lord, willing to wait, willing to grow, willing to love and be loved. Thank you so much. Continue to grow this church for your honor for your glory and we want to be seen as a church that truly reflects who Jesus Christ is because this is all about you Lord not us be magnified in what we do as a church in Jesus name Amen